Let's stand together. Thanks for your patience this morning. We're uh, working on some technical things with the screen. And you may or may not have some words up today, so I'll help you out. But I know you have hands, and I know you can clap, so that's what we'll get started with. Can you do that with me? So I just want to invite you to, um, as this next song says, to take a moment and just remember, reflect on who God is and who we are. Just let that soak for just a moment. We're reflecting on who God is and all that God is and who we are and all that we are. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lifting my Lord again. Take a moment to remember. Come 
my bond to the yoke of Jesus. This yoke is easy, his burden is so light. No longer am I ever the yoke of this world. I come up under the yoke of Jesus. This yoke is easy, his burden is so carries me your love carries me all the valleys all the valleys and the darkest and the darkest places your love carries your love carries me through all the valleys and the darkest places Amazing thing about God is the everythingness, if I can make up a word, of God. Sometimes we like to, I don't know, put God in a very small box, right? But when it comes to God, uh, everything belongs. And so I invite you just to open your heart to the everythingness of God. And just yield to the Spirit this morning. Speaking, be my everything. 
waking, God in my sleeping, God in my resting, God in my working, God in my thinking, God in my sleeping. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful worship. You may be seated this morning. I'd like to welcome you, uh, everyone. Thanks for coming today. If you're a guest, would you be so kind to grab one of the Connect cards? You can find them in the pew in front of you, or you can use the inside portion of your bulletin, and it'd be a great opportunity just to get connected here at the church. Pastor Greg or Pastor Josh will send you some information, send you an email, see if you have any questions, and so we just want to welcome you this morning. Also, I just want to mention a couple inserts that are in your bulletin. Uh, there's a couple great opportunities that are coming up this summer to get, um, to have a chance to just grow deeper in your faith. There's a workshop that's coming up this coming Saturday. There's information in there. We want to encourage you to sign up. You can sign up here or go online, find out about that. And then also a lot of the summer growth groups that are going on this summer. We really just encourage you to take the opportunity this summer to grow deeper in your faith that, that you kind of help Help yourself, so to speak, be open to God's spirit, making God everything in every aspect of your life. So we want to encourage you with that. Also, just so you know, next Sunday is what we call our annual celebration Sunday. And we'll be uh, having an annual meeting after the 10 o'clock service. So we invite everyone to come next Sunday, be part of the worship services, celebrate, and then stick around for the meeting. There'll be some food, fellowship, things like that. So uh, we want to invite you to those things. At this time, uh, Carol Bailey is going to come and pray for us uh, as we prepare to receive our offering this morning. Thanks. Good morning and welcome. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are everything to us. We thank you for bringing us together here today to worship you, to support each other, to fellowship, and to thank you for your many blessings. Lord, in this world when there is so much suffering, so much pain, we are grateful that you remain everything to us. Lord, we pray for those who don't have love, don't have peace, don't have the basics of life. Help us not to lose our faith, but to remember that you are still there. Help us, more importantly, that whatever we have, we we will pass that on to those who are in need. Thank you, Lord, for this communion day. Help us that we will remember that the sacrifice that has been made for us is one that continues to inform our lives and to bless us every day of our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us so much. Help us that as we go throughout the day, throughout the week, and throughout our lives, that we will remember your grace, your mercy, and that we will extend that grace and mercy to everyone. Thank you for the word. Help us to listen. Help us to be attentive and help us that we will convey this to those who are not here. Help those who are not here that they will, their spirits will be here and that in every way we'll convey the message in our lives, in our love, in our care and the way we conduct ourselves in the world. Bless us, guide us, keep us and protect us. And we thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen.
atmosphere is changing now. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Evidence is all around. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflowing place fill our hearts with your love your love surrounds us you're the reason we came to encounter your love your love surrounds us
special time of the year uh, for a group of people. You may have noticed some caps and gowns around, uh, time of celebration, graduation. I want to invite those uh, who are part of our congregation who are graduating from high school this year to come forward at this time. Come on up, you guys. Let's give them a hand. Just uh, sharing personally as, as the youth pastor here at First Baptist, this is a moment that I have been um, excited about and slightly dreading for five years. Uh, dreading because this is such an amazing group of young men and women. Um, I just have known for five years that this moment of graduation would mark such a huge difference in our ministries here because the ways that you all have been present, have invested, have led... These guys have some pretty big personalities. Um, just, it's, it's something that is going to be so different. But excited because in the same way I've seen the ways that your gifts, your strengths, your kindness, your character, you're going to go out into the world and just make a huge difference in wherever God places you. Uh, and I know that to be so true uh, in my heart. And I know that the, these guys have made such an impact on this church in ways that many of us haven't even seen. So we are celebrating you today. We want to give you a chance just to share a little bit about uh, your name, your high school, and what your plan is for next year. So, uh, Hi. Uh, my name is James Mozell. Most people call me Jim. Uh, Pastor Greg's my father. Uh, so most of you know who I am. Uh, this year I graduated from Hopkins Academy in Hadley. Uh, next year I'm going to take a gap year and I'm going to play junior hockey in Springfield and continue coaching youth hockey, which has been, hockey's a big passion of mine, so I'll continue to do that. And then the year after that I'm going to head off to uh, university. Uh, yep. Hi, I'm Sarita. Um, I go to Amherst High School and I'm going to be going to UMass in the spring. Hi, I'm Lydia. I'm about to graduate from Amherst High School, too. Um, and I'm going to Bard next year, which is in upstate New York. Hi, I'm Jessica. I am graduating from Frontier Regional, and next year I'll be going to UMass. Uh, hi, I'm Kyle Lindholm. I graduated last Friday from Belchertown High School, and in August I'll be going to University of New Hampshire. Thank you, guys. We, don't, we just want to pray for you, bless you, thank you, uh, and, and send you with God's blessing. So uh, let's bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning as we get to celebrate um, just this huge accomplishment, this wonderful transition, this time of achievement and celebration in the lives of these young people. Thank you so much for the ways that each of them have been part of this community, some of them for their entire lives. Thank you for the ways that they have used their gifts, their passions, their joys themselves to bless us, to bless their peers, to bless so many in the youth ministry, in the children's ministry, uh, through worship, through leadership, going on retreats and camps and missions trips, in all of the ways that they have been present here and just invested in this community. We give you thanks and praise, Father. We ask now as they go, as they prepare to take these next steps, that you would go with them, that whatever step they take into the future, God, they would take that step knowing that you are right beside them. God, that wherever you place them next, uh, whether that's in university, in jobs, in whatever community or place, if that's just across the street or in a new state, wherever it is, God, might they know that they are there by your will and that you are with them and that you can use them. 
Help them to find communities where they can root themselves, places where they can grow, places where they can serve. Help them to find people who will invest in them and mentor them. Help them to find ways that they can glorify and worship you in whatever situation or setting they are in. God, we ask that you would be their light, that would illuminate the path going forward in this time of transition. And we thank you for the way that you are present and faithful to us in our time of need, in our times of change, in all of the days of our lives. And might that be the knowledge that informs these young people's steps as they graduate this, at this time. We thank you and we give you praise, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's give them one more hand. Well, as we celebrate uh, graduations during this season, it's a great example of how we as a culture uh, choose to intentionally celebrate or honor things that really matter most. Rather, it's graduations, rather it's weddings, or it's memorials like the Vietnam Memorial or holidays like MLK Day. We recognize that we live in, in a culture where we can live lives so filled with rush and hurry and worry that we can just kind of whoosh by things that are really important. And so we mark those things that we want to remember most that have richest meaning. And in some of the same way, Jesus instituted communion because Jesus knew that we would live lives that would be so easy for us to be so acculturated around us and living with such stress and hurry and worry that we need space. We need space to slow down, to reflect to recalibrate our souls, to refocus our minds on what really matters most. Will you join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? We'll begin in verse 23. In the Blue Bibles, it's found on page 1136, 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 13, where the Apostle Paul really helps us to understand the theological significance of communion, but also how we can prepare ourselves so that communion can be most meaningful for us and fulfilling God's call for, for communion. Now, the early church often called communion simply the breaking of bread. Uh, throughout time, uh, communion really focuses on relationship with God and that we're in communion with each other. In some traditions, we hear Eucharist, which comes from the Greek Eucharisto, which means a celebration. It means thanksgiving, that in the Eucharist, in communion, we are shouting out, thank you, God. We praise you, God, that through Christ, you are the Savior of our souls. And other traditions call it the Last Supper, which focuses on the historic reality that there was in this time and place a supper that took place in which Jesus instituted communion. Join me in 1 Corinthians 11 in verse 23. <clears throat> For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed. And let's stop there because the, we can easily pass by this as kind of introduction by the Apostle Paul, but it's pregnant with meaning because the Passover meal was so significant among the Jewish people, among Jesus' people, among uh, our Jewish friends today. The, the Passover meal was always celebrated by families, extended family. It was probably the most significant family gathering of the year. And it's interesting that Jesus didn't say, now go celebrate Passover with your families. But he's celebrating together with his community. And what that also tells me is that we're a family of faith, that, that when we take of the Eucharist together, we really are declaring that we're a family that we're together in the faith through the joys of life sharing, through the heartache of life coming alongside each other in brokenness, helping bringing healing. When we wander astray to courageously and gently speak God's truth into each other's lives, that we're a family together. Now let's understand this context of the Passover. See, we can miss so much of what communion's about if we forget that the context was a Passover meal. In the midst of the Passover meal, uh, the focus was looking back on the exodus out of Egypt, that the Hebrew people had spent 400 back-breaking years enslaved in Egypt, and now God heard their cry and lifted them up and supernaturally brought them out 
in the exodus out of slavery. And that's our spiritual story, isn't it? That we were enslaved and in bondage to sin and brokenness and, and filth and depravity. And we have been rescued. We've been brought out of that slavery into relationship with God through Christ. And then there's also the Passover blood of the Lamb. That God called in Egypt the Hebrew people. I wonder if, what is this about? The blood of the Lamb put it on the doorpost of our house. They didn't understand, but they obeyed. And they took a perfect lamb without blemish. And a little bit of the blood they put on their doorposts. And then death passed over their house. Thus the pass over. That's our story. That we have the perfect lamb without sin, without blemish, who fulfilled God's law for us that we could never fulfill. And you see, Jesus was the Passover lamb at this meal. And it's, and it's by his blood that God's wrath and, and that death passes over us and we come into life. Now, imagine the scene at the first Passover. Let's try to put on our first century uh, glasses or attempt to you know, sit at the table and imagine what it was 2,000 years ago. First, the Passover story would have been read, just as it was always read, by kind of the head of the family. And then there's bitter herbs. Any people who have participated in a Passover Seder know that the bitter herbs, chewing the bitter herbs was a sign. It was to remember that we'd once been enslaved in Egypt. You know, I, I wonder if before communion sometimes we had to pass out bitter herbs and chew those bitter herbs. So, ooh. And there's a reminder, oh, once upon a time, my life without Christ was like that bitter herb or what my life could have been without Christ. And it reminds us as we reflect on the difference Christ has been and will make in our lives. And then the matzah bread, the, the, the unleavened bread, which was a sign back to the lamb that had been sacrificed and is a sign of Christ. And then have you noticed in the gospel accounts, we always read intentionally they were reclining together. You know, the, the gospels are so carefully edited that, that there isn't a careless word. And here's what I think is so important. In the Passover meal, everyone reclined because people who are free recline. Slaves stand during a meal. And it was a sign to the people that you are no longer slaves in bondage to sin or brokenness or darkness, but now you may recline because you've been set free by the blood of the Lamb, who now we know has been fulfilled by Christ. So this is the context in which all of this happens. And there's a great surprise at that, at that last supper, which I really believe was kind of the first supper, the first of Jesus inaugurating the new covenant. You see, the focus was completely on how the Passover set people free from Egypt. And so what the disciples are now expecting is, is this when Messiah is going to set us free from Rome? Is this where he is going to ride triumphantly into Jerusalem, throw off the shackles of Rome and bring his kingdom? And Jesus had a real surprise for them. He was going to set them free, but not with the weapons of this world, but he was going to set them free spiritually from their bondage, which is so much more deeper and profound than a political movement. In his book, The, the Meal Jesus Gave, uh, N.T. Wright, the former Bishop of Durham, who now is a professor at St. Andrews University, just listen, let it soak in how he captures the awe, the mystery, the wonder of what it would have been like at that first communion. Jesus was speaking. He was going to say the words that the head of the family always said, you knew them by heart. Your father or grandfather had said them year after year after year after year. The bread that our father ate when they came out of the land of Egypt, the cup of life, the cup of freedom. But, but then everything changed. Had we had too much wine to drink? Are we confused? What, what, what is it Jesus is saying? Take this bread and eat it. This is my body given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Our world just turned upside down. Everybody was staring uh, quietly, kind of avoiding eye contact. You were convinced that Jesus had gone over the top this time, 
This was the Passover meal, the meal that said, you know, the Egypt stuff, the freedom stuff. How could this be about Jesus' body? And why should we do this in remembrance of Jesus? What could this mean? The awe, the wonder, the connection with God's redemptive thread throughout history. And then we read beginning in verse 23, Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you do it in remembrance of me. To the bread, Jesus said, this is my body and the cup, this is my blood. I believe this is symbolic. Different theological traditions have different views. They aren't worth dividing the kingdom over. But I believe this was symbolic because Jesus' body and blood is sitting there as he says, this is my body, this is my blood. And because the context of the Passover meal, the elements were all pointing to a reality. And they were signs to point. So I believe that bread and wine are tangible signs But it's easy for us to just pass it along and forget some of the significance. The bread is a sign of the body of Christ that was beaten and flogged mercilessly and hammered to the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. And that Jesus on the cross took God's justice in our place. God's wrath against darkness, against sin, against evil, against violence, against corruption... All of that was heaped upon Jesus. And Jesus took that upon himself in our place. And what's often missed is Jesus also took the curses of the law. So the Old Testament law was designed uh, to to help help shape a covenant community, but also to help us realize we can't fulfill God's holiness. We can't fulfill this whole law. And so it pointed for our need for redemption that's fulfilled in Christ. Christ. Christ fulfilled the law for us. That's why we're not under law, we're under grace. But Jesus also took all the curses of the law. The law came with blessings and curses. Jesus took all those curses of the law in our place upon himself. I can't imagine the moment when darkness was reigning, like God shut out the lights, and all of our sin, filth, and guilt, and all the curses of the law are heaped upon Jesus. When we look at the bread, when we take the cup, that's what Jesus said, remember. How powerful for us. And, and the juice is a sign of Jesus' blood. Now, n- now let's remember that really, in, in some ways, the blood of Christ is spackled all over the pages of Scripture. And that might kinda, kind of offend us. Jesus' blood on every page, that's exactly what it's designed to do. Because sin is so vile, causes such brokenness and warfare and violence and suffering in our world, that only through, through life, through blood, can there be atonement with a holy God. And so, think about this redemptive thread th- through, throughout history. Follow this with me. In the epic story in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sin. The world becomes fallen. Their eyes are open, not to innocent purity, but suddenly their eyes are open to guilt and filth, and they look at each other and say, we're naked. And then we read that God covered them over to cover their shame. And what material did God use? Animal skins. So I wonder if the next day Adam and Eve are walking like, what's that bloody animal carcass? We've never seen a dead animal. And they realized, oh, that's what it took to cover over our shame. Then we come to the Passover, in which in order for the Hebrew people to have exodus, to be brought out of slavery and into freedom, came the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And then in the Mosaic law, we have this amazing scene where we have a lamb without blemish, perfect, pointing to Christ, and then we have a goat. And so the the lamb, the, the priest, put the hand on the lamb to be a portrait of all the sins of the people going into that lamb that was then tragically sacrificed, pointing to Christ. And then the goat. Now remember, in, in Hebrew culture, a goat is basically the most bothersome thing around. And the goat, the priest puts his hand on the goat as if all the sins, and then the goat is set free, the scapegoat. 
were the scapegoat. That was symbolic to understand that, that, that Christ was sacrificed and we were set free. Do you remember when Pilate attempted to negotiate? I'll let Barabbas uh, uh, go free. And he knew the crowds would say, oh no, uh, let Jesus go free. Barabbas, who was guilty, was set free. Jesus, who was innocent, was crucified. We're like Barabbas. We're like the scapegoat that we've been set free even though we don't deserve it because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. Now, communion brings us to life. The Eucharist helps us to experience. It's a feast for the senses. Think about this. It's auditory. It's visual. It's kinesthetic. All of the learning styles. We sing, we hear, we see, we touch, we taste, and we repeat it again. God, the master communicator, knows how to engage all of our senses in what matters most as we learn to live Christocentric lives in the shadow of the cross. I read several years ago a study from Indiana University that brought together sociology, communications, and, and psychology professors. And they did a study uh, giving information to people of different ages, and then 30 days later asked how much of that information that they remembered. What they heard, 7%. Only 7% 30 days later. You know, for you professors here, that must be really kind of painful, right? 30 days later, what we hear, only 7%. It can kind of depress me if I didn't believe that the Spirit of God can supersede that. Amen? What we see and hear, 16%. What we hear and see, 21%. What we hear, see, and do, it jumps to 80%. What we hear, see, do, and repeat, 90% was remembered 30 days later. You know, I could have saved Indiana University a lot of money and said, just look to the New Testament and this thing that Jesus did because Jesus took all of this feast for the senses. And so in the midst of the Eucharist, we touch. I mean, to touch the bread, remember. With the cup, with the wine or the juice, remember. I often choose to do what theologians call intinction, I often dip it in, and I see the bread saturated, and I just imagine Jesus' body saturated with his own blood for me. Well, in verses 24 and 25, Jesus twice says, do this in remembrance of me. You know, whatever we value, we find ways to remember and ways to honor. Let me just ask a brief quiz, all right? And, and, and we can be honest here. This is a covenant community. We're kind of a big therapy group together, okay? So we can be honest, all right? How many of us have ever forgotten maintenance for our car, and because of that, there was like a cost for it? How many of us have ever forgotten car? Raise them high. Thank you. I love you, because me too, yeah. So how many of us uh, have ever missed a meeting? You just like, psh, and then you realize, oh, I completely missed that meeting. How many of us? Some of us? Yeah. How many of us have ever missed a birthday? All right? How many of us have just missed somebody's birthday? Wow. You know, I, I, know, I know a pastor true, who missed a funeral. That took him about 20 years to even get back to, like, uh, a decent place with his congregation. Now, how many of us who, who are married have ever missed our anniversary? Be honest. Anyone? Come on. No one? Two of you. Oh, look at that. Hold, 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 hold his hand up. I'll see you in my office Monday morning. We'll, we'll work through this together, right? Yeah, two people, first service, raise their hand. I won't tell you who, okay? Matter of fact, people, when you turn the page to your next calendar, you know, however you, know, you do that, first thing, circle that anniversary. Okay, guys? Circle the anniversary. You see, the reason why this is a big deal is because these are things that really matter to us, don't they? And it can be easy for us to kind of blow by them. So we intentionally mark our calendar. We intentionally have some kind of traditions to help mark those. And so Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Do this so in our busy lives, we don't just blow past the cross, the sacrifice of Christ. But we do this also to proclaim to each other, to shout out what Christ has done. Verse 26, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion is a proclamation. We're proclaiming to ourselves all over again. Have you ever wanted to preach? I know that in um, 
surveys that people fear death second and they fear public speaking first. So they'd rather die than speak. But if you ever uh, wanted to, to be able to just preach, to, to, to declare the gospel well to somebody, one of the ways we do that, when we take the Eucharist, when we take communion, we're declaring what Christ has done to ourselves. We're declaring it to each other. Matter of fact, look at the person next to you. If, if it's kind of freaky, sit somewhere else next week. Look at the person next to you and just say, Christ died for you. Say it, come on. Christ died for you. Do it, people both sides, behind and front. Let's do it. Christ died for you. Amen. Christ died for you, Jim. I see you. Oh. Yeah. You see, it's not that hard, is it? But it's a little freaky. But that's what we do in the Eucharist. That's exactly what we're doing. We're declaring to each other the Lord's death until he comes. It's past, present, and future. It looks to the past. We remember the cross. To the present, do this now. And to the future, until he comes back. Matter of fact, I went to seminary with a guy named Bob Meeks. Uh, Bob shared with us his story. As a matter of fact, Bob was a missionary to the Philippines, and our church supported him for a few years. Bob, and, and, and then he also launched a, a, a church that was a, a thriving church. So Bob grew up with some real challenges and dysfunction. And um, after an early marriage, which dissolved, and some addiction, some friends just invited him to a growth group, Bible study. And he just felt like, wow, I, this is like, this is such positive community. I've never really been around people like this. So then they invited him to church. And one of those Sundays after a while came time for communion. And he decided on that Sunday, I, I think I'm going to do this. And he came forward and he took the elements and he sat down. And in that moment, God's spirit whispered to him in a profound way, Bob, this is what I did for you. And all the unworthiness that he had felt, how, I, in that moment, he gave his heart to Christ. See, we proclaim what Christ has done to each other as a community and to the world through the Eucharist. But we're challenged to think about how we do this, preparing our heart. Verse 27, as we wrap up, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, the context here needs to be remembered. The context is a church in Corinth just out of control. There's uh, sin happening, which is being flaunted. And there's such disunity that people are showing up early to, to the love feast, to this Eucharist celebration. And some of them are eating all the bread and they're drinking the wine and they're getting a little bit buzzed with the wine. And then there's disunity and there's people hungry who aren't getting enough to eat and it's a mess. And Paul's speaking into this, but it has relevancy and challenge for us. The first is examination. Well, we slow down and we examine ourselves. Have you thought about this, that for, for, for Protestants, this is about the only time we stop talking in worship. And we just slow down and we create space. And we ask ourselves, God, this is about covenant with you. Am I being faithful in your covenant? Am I being faithful in a covenant community? Is there someone I've injured, hurt, wounded in our church family that that I need to, to, to run to and to confess? Is there sin? Maybe secrets and no one knows about, but you, God, know. Are there impure thoughts that are warping my mind? Do I need to repent because I've hurt someone? Do I have idolatrous appetites in my heart that I'm chasing that will shape me in ways that will lead away from you, God? And then there's also celebration. There, there's also the Eucharisto celebration where we're in awe that God would send Christ to sacrifice his life for us that we actually receive God's love. We just don't hear about or learn, but it's a moment, God, I receive that you really love me, that we celebrate, Christ, you have forgiven me. It's so hard for us sometimes to appropriate that because we're so broken. Think that in our global village that there are saints all throughout the world, God's people. Some are in Gothic cathedrals, some are in basements for fear of persecution. Some might be in open fields in the beauty of the savannah. 
Others might be in strip malls and kind of funky churches. But you know what? It really doesn't matter because there's one thing. We all come together. And the saints throughout history, we come together in this moment. And this is what unifies us. When we focus on the Eucharist, we have Christocentric lives. And so Jesus gathered with his closest friends, the disciples. It was the Passover meal. They'd heard it over and over and over. They were waiting for all the liturgy. And then Jesus looked to them and the Passover lamb said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat, do this in remembrance of me. And then Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. And they were expecting the words that they'd heard for generations. But then Jesus says, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The Eucharist table at First Baptist is Christ's table. If you are a Christ follower, you're invited to this table. Rather, this is the first church home you've ever had, or rather you come from a, a Presbyterian, a Baptist, a Catholic, an Orthodox, a Methodist, you know, whatever it is, if you cherish heart, Christ in your heart, or if you wish you cherished Christ in your heart, you're invited to Christ's table. We'll come forward to receive the Eucharist, take the elements back to our seat, and then let's just have extended silence. We struggle with silence. Let's have extended silence just to reflect, to repent, to celebrate. All is ready by Christ. I want to invite the worship team to come forward to send us out with the joy and the Eucharisto, the thanksgiving that's in our heart. You know, as we quietly reflect, I need to be honest, sometimes I, I peek and watch the streams of people coming forward, of you and I coming forward. And it's a beautiful moment that reminds us that we're a covenant community together because many of us, we know each other's stories. We know our joys. We know our sorrows. We know our faith and our doubts. We're on a journey together through the times that we've struggled and the breakthroughs that we have experienced, and yet we're in a covenant community together coming home to Christ. Amen? Praise be to God. Thanks, Pastor Greg. Let's stand together and sing. Separate 
created all of the cosmos with all of their beauty, the mystery, and the abundance. Glory to you, O God, that when we fell away from you, you chose to still covenant with humanity, not because of our own righteousness, not because we could ever impress you, but you have just sovereignly chosen to covenant with your fallen, broken people. Glory to you, O Christ who left behind the glory, the privilege, the honor, the worship of heaven to become one of us, to show us how to live, to sacrifice your life on the cross, and to be raised from the dead to overcome death for us. Glory to you, O Spirit, who has been implanted within us as the deposit guaranteeing our salvation that you would convict us of our sin, remind us of God's truth, and shape us more into the character of Christ, and then gift us to be the hands, the feet, the voice of Christ in a broken world. Glory to you, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go with God's grace.